Uh, Bismillah, before we begin, a number of uh, people asked me about uh, age limits and whatnot. Uh, again, parents, it's up to you. Obviously, this topic is not one of a, you know, explicit nature in the sensual sense. It is one that is a little bit possibly scary to those who might so be disinclined or inclined. So that's your decision as parents. It's not something that I can dictate upon you. You know, it's you know your child better, so it's up to you. I'm not going to intentionally give any horror stories. It's rather an academic talk about the reality in light of the Quran and Sunnah. So really, it's up to you uh, about the uh, age limit. <coughs> With that, uh, let us begin. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd. It is something that I find very interesting that each and every culture in the world, each and every civilization has these notions, myths, superstitions of entities that exist beyond the human world. This is universal. No civilization, primitive or modern, advanced or in the jungle, doesn't matter, exists, except that they believe in something beyond this physical world. And they have different names for them. In English, we have the demons and the ghosts and whatnot. And in every culture and civilization, I just came from uh, Norway, and they have you know, this thing that comes out of the woods, and they will take you, and this and that. Well, now we call them in English trolls or goblins. But the notion is there, that there's something that lives in the beyond. And they're very scary, and they're harmful. And there's something you cannot control, but they control you. And it is interesting, you go to the native Indians, they believe this. You go to the Aborigines, they believe this. You go to, even in this day and age, we're living in the 21st century America. Look at Hollywood and how many movies are dedicated to the supernatural, the possessions, to, you know, uh, the exorcist and its, you know, genre. You know, all of this to this day. And this is... You know, we are supposed to be the pinnacle of civilization. But this notion of some entities or some realities living in worlds that are simultaneous to us, but yet not quite our world, right? This is something that is ingrained in all of humanity. From our perspective, of course, this shows us that the reason why all cultures agree is because it is real, right? From our perspective, we say... The reason why each and every civilization believes in spiritual entities, and they are generally speaking spiritual entities, uh, ghosts or demons or ghouls or whatnot, they believe in them because they are real and these societies experience them. These societies experience them. And there was a very, there is, I think, I don't know if it's still ongoing or not, there's a number of series on uh, the uh, sci-fi channels and, and um, other learning networks and whatnot, in which allegedly they interview live people, you know, about what has happened to them. You know, the haunting of such and such. And, and, and the reality is, now these are educated people, you listen to them. Many of them say, I never believed in this stuff. I was a, raised as a very, you know, modern, very educated person. I never believed this could happen. But then what are you going to do when, you know, XYZ begins to happen, right? And from our perspective, we look at all of this, we read all of this, and it fits in perfectly with our worldview. And in all honesty, for the believer, for the mu'min, all of these stories of the other nationalities and other groups should actually increase his or her iman. That in reality, this is a sign of our iman, of our religion being true. One of the signs of our religion being true, it explains even the supernatural and the paranormal. It explains in complete logic and rationality. When you study the characteristics of the jinn, and you see what is happening in other societies and even in our society, everything is explained. So I find this to be very fascinating and interesting. And also, before we begin, we're still in the introduction. Uh, realize this is a part one. Uh, there will be, at some uh, unspecified time in the future, a part two, which will be definitely more technical and perhaps, I don't want to use that term, uh, perhaps maturity would be more, uh, you know, discretion is definitely going to be implied, uh, um, applied there. And it will talk about... Part two will talk about black magic and possession and what that's going to be part two. So part one is really not about that type of stuff. Part one is we're just talking about the reality of the jinn in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah. Now what exactly does the term jinn mean? Where does it come from? The Arabic word jinn comes from a root that implies something that is concealed from the eyes, something that is hidden. And so there are so many words in the Arabic language from this root, 
all of which imply hiding. For example, a shield in Arabic is called mijan, because you're hiding yourself behind the uh, shield. An embryo, what is an embryo called in Arabic? Janin. The embryo is called a janin because it is hidden in the womb of the mother. Um, the verb jannah, without the ta marbuta, just the verb jim, noon, with the shadda, jannah. The verb jannah, without the ta marbuta, not the noun jannah, but the verb jannah, means this, Allah, the spreading of the night, the enveloping of the night so that you can't see anything. In the Quran, Allah says about Ibrahim, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَأَى كوكبا. When the night jannah, he saw the... He saw the stars. The meaning of Jannah here means the darkness enveloped it. He couldn't see uh, anything. And that is why also Jannah, the noun, is a garden that is enclosed with a wall. You can't see inside it. So Jannah with a noun, the garden that has been enclosed by a wall, therefore you cannot see inside it. And madness in Arabic is Jinnah with a kasra. Am yaquluna bihi Jinnah. Do they say our Prophet has Jinnah in him? And Jinnah is madness. And from Jinnah we get Majnoon. So a person is mad because his intellect seemingly disappears. Because the meaning of Jannah always is hidden. So Majnoon, the one whose intellect or whose rationality does not exist, or at least you don't see it, it's disappeared. And this is all of these terms come from the same root, and that is to hide or to be hidden. And that is why the term Jinn is also applied to this entity, because it is an entity that is completely hidden from the eyes of men. We do not see them. They uh, are in a world that is beyond our physical world that we uh, inhabit. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions jinn in the Quran and our Prophet talks a little bit about the jinn. We don't have that many ahadith about the jinn and therefore the fact of the matter is we have to uh, take what we can from the Quran and Sunnah that is going to take it as a fact. The rest is folklore and legend. And we don't base our religion on folklore and legend. But there's no harm in narrating certain things that we think we know about the jinn. There's no harm in narrating things that we believe we know about the jinn. And I will always differentiate between what is Quran and Sunnah and what is folklore or, or you know things that we might assume in our times. That we have to be very clear here. If Allah says it, end of story. We take it as fact. However, if it's something we discover upon ourselves or seems to be a reality, then we will say this is a theory, this is a possibility, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So... What does Allah tell us about the jinn? What does our Prophet tell us about the jinn? Of the things we know about the jinn is that they were created before men. The Quran is very explicit. The Quran is very explicit that before we existed, the jinn existed. Before Allah created Adam, He had created the jinn. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالِ مِنْ حَمَئٍ مَسْنُونَ We created man from a type of hard clay, rock that had become rock solid, that you could knock on it and it would reverberate. وَالْجَانَّ خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ مِنْ نَارِ السَّمُونَ And the jan, the plural of jinn is jan. And the jan we had created before that from, now memorize the Arabic, نَارِ السَّمُونَ so a nar that is samum. What is samum? We'll come to it. So this is one adjective that Allah says. We created jinn from a nar, from a fire that is samum. Also, the Quran mentions that Allah Azza wa created jinn from min marijin min nar, from marij of nar. So samum and marij. Keep these adjectives. We'll come back to it. So Allah says that we created the jinn min marijin min nar. And Allah says we created jinn from nar is samum. These are the two main adjectives given. Of course, nar is in both. And sometimes Allah says we created jinn from nar. Sometimes He says from nar is samum. Sometimes He says from marijin min, min nar. Surah Al-Rahman, that khalaq al jannah min marijin min nar. We created jinn from marij of nar. So these are really the main uh, descriptions. Our Prophet ﷺ, exact same phrase in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet ﷺ said, خُلِقَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ مِن نُور the angels have been created from nur. وَخُلِقَتِ الْجَان مِن مَارِجٍ مِن نَار And the jinn have been created from marij of fire. وَخُلِقَتِ 
insan or khuliqa adam excuse me mimma wusifa lakum and adam has been created in a manner that has been clearly described for you because the description of the creation of adam is far more explicit than the description of the creation of the jinn we don't have how the jinn were created we simply have what they were created from and of course of the evidences that the jinn were created from fire is the well known incident of iblis and adam what did iblis say ana khayrun minhu khalaqatani min narin wa khalaqatahu min teen and scholars point out the first racist was iblis the first racist was iblis because iblis was the one who th thought i am better because of where i come from i am better because of what i have been used to be created by right so he thought he's better simply because he's created from now but the point is we don't, don't, don't want to go into that tangent the point is iblis very clearly says khalaqatani min nar you created me from nar wa khalaqatahu min teen and you created him from uh, teen so what does marij mean and what does samum mean these are the two main adjectives that occur in the quran about the creation as for marij marij means to merge or to combine Maraj al Bahraini al Taqiyan. The two oceans are interweaving and mixing. Maraja. So, Maraja means to mix and to weave together, to flow out and to weave as you go forward. So, Marij in Minar from a mixture of fires, from different types of fires. And Ibn Abbas commented that the Marij of the Nar is the corner of the flames that you have all the different colors the red and the green and the blue and the orange and the yellow and if you look at the fire or the flame right if you have a very large fire this you cannot see on a match you can see it on a larger fire if you have a large fire the periphery of the fire it has all of these bizarre colors very interesting colors ibn abbas said that is what they were created from the the marriage the very ending of the uh, fire as for the word samum, samum has been understood in two different ways. One meaning is that samum is a smokeless fire. It is the, uh, a fire that is raw heat without any dukhan, without any smoke. And that is valid because the jinn don't have smoke. They are created from a fire that doesn't have an, uh, we don't see the smoke, we don't see the ashes coming down, right? So the jinn have been created from a smokeless fire. Nar is Samum. This is one interpretation. And another interpretation, Ibn Abbas said, Samum is the light of the lightning. This is a different type of light, not the light of the match. This is the light of the lightning. And in, in reality, this is the same as the first meaning because the lightning, does it have smoke? No, it doesn't have smoke, right? And so the light of lightning is a smokeless light, right? Now, this is now Quran here. I'm going to add my own theory, take it or leave it. And this is not a fact. This is my theory, my understanding of my own understanding of the Quran and Sunnah and my own interactions with this uh, uh, species. In my humble opinion, uh, it is as if the jinn have been created from what we call energy. What physicists call energy. They are on the energy spectrum. And this demonstrates when non-Muslim ghost hunters, if you see the documentaries or TLC channel, or whatever, right? When they go to a house and they want to see are there any haunted spirits, what do they do? And these are people that have never studied the Quran and Sunnah. They don't believe in the Quran and Sunnah. But experience has taught them that you can detect on the electromagnetic scale, you can detect on these, they have their counters that have energy readings in them, right? And also, uh, other things prove this as well. Uh, and if you look at the characteristics of the Quran and Sunnah of the jinn, they, these are the characteristics of energy. Going at the speed of light, not having a particular form, right? Being able to do, uh, going through walls, as we will talk about in a while. This is energy. Our, our radio waves right now, our internet, our phone waves. They're coming through the walls here. There's a type of energy on the spectrum. And therefore, if you look at Madijim min nar, nar is samum, the, what exactly is lightning? It's a type of energy. 
right? So Allah knows best, this is my uh, interpretation, my understanding, and also uh, not to give you, uh, by the way, I'm not going to give you too many horror stories, I don't want to do it, if you, those of you who came for that, I'm sorry, but that's not the, this is not the campfire gin night where we smoke marshmallows and we have the campfire gin stories, we'll do that maybe sometime for the young men and women so that they can be really scared, but not right now, inshallah. Um, but in the course of the lecture, I'll give a few stories here and there. So of the um, modern things that we know of, is that there are unexplained lights that many cameras have captured around the world. And this is a well-known phenomenon. You find it on YouTube all the time. And you look at these things, and sometimes once in a while it'll even make local news networks. Right? That there was a strange light over uh, you know, this restaurant and the, the camera captured it and they put it on the local news station. If there's nothing else to show, they might as well show something like this. And you see this, you know, I mean, you, it's in, in this land and in other lands. Uh, and when you look at these things, by and large, what are they? They're orbs of light just floating around here and there. And they just pause here, go there, and then they just go away. And therefore, the camera is capturing a spectrum of energy which is light. It's capturing something like this, and then we as human beings are aghast. What is this? But in reality, it's nothing. It's simply, you know, uh, wandering jinn, whatever, and uh, it does not realize it's being videotaped or whatnot. And therefore, the, uh, the, the, the camera captures this. All of this kind of li uh, l adds if you like uh, credence to the fact that the jinn are a type of energy. But if you want to stick to the Quran and Sunnah, the Quran and Sunnah says, Marijim min nar and nar is samum, which in reality is also energy because what is fire and what is lightning other than a type of energy? But nonetheless, this explains uh, certain things. Now, we also know from the Quran indirectly and from the Sahaba directly that the jinn inhabited the earth before Adam did. They were created before Adam, that's clear. They inhabited the earth before Adam. This is not explicit in the Quran, it is implicit, it's implied. Where is it implied? In the story of the creation of Adam. When Allah said that I'm going to create a new creation, the Mala'ika said, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكُ نُقَدِّسُ لَكَ Are you going to put in this world an entity that will cause blood to be shed and cause great injustices. Why would you do this when we are here praising you and worshipping you? And Ibn Abbas and others, they make tafsir of this and they say, the Malaika knew the reality of men because of the reality of jinn. How would the Malaika know that men will kill one another? That men will cause fasad and fitna in the earth? How would they know that? When the malaika have never seen men, because Allah had already created the jinn. And the jinn was the first creation on this earth that shed blood of each other unjustly. And they went to war. Ibn Abbas has a long story of a civil war between the jinn and the malaika to get involved and, and basically curb them and, and, and stop the civil war. And so they realized that the jinn have the power to disobey Allah and this is what happens. Now Allah says, I'm creating another creation that also has the power to disobey me. So the malaika were like, basically one is enough. Why would you want another? Why would you create another creation? And here we are. And Allah said, I have wisdom that you do not have. Therefore, this means that uh, the Quran is indirect. The Sahaba are explicit that in this world, there were jinns before, uh, uh, before Adam alayhi salam came down. The jinns uh, don't seem to have a particular shape or form. Classical scholars debated this and the sharia ah is quiet on this point. So the sharia ah does not say what is the original form of a jinn. But in my humble opinion, since the sharia ah is silent, I give you my opinion and this opinion is not just new, it is going back in the past. Scholars have differed what is the real shape of the jinn and the reality is the question is absurd. To have a real shape, you have to have a physical body. If you don't have a physical body, you don't have a real shape. So when we ask the question, a lot of us ask, what does a jinn really look like? The response, the question is only valid when the entity has physical structure, flesh or blood or three-dimensional or whatnot. You don't ask, what does energy look like? Energy doesn't look like anything. Right? You don't ask what does energy look like. There is no original structure. Our eyes cannot 
see the reality of energy. Can we see these waves being bombarded? Can we see the microwave? Can we see? Uh, we, we don't see. It doesn't register. So, in my humble opinion, and this is the position of many classical scholars, there is no original structure of the jinn. The jinn can't have an original structure. The jinn are simply as they are. They are in a world that doesn't have structure. And that's why for our minds it's difficult to, to encompass, to, to come across. They don't occupy the three-dimensional world that we live in. They have a totally different parallel universe, quite literally. You know, they are here, yet they're not here. They are in this world, yet they are in a separate world apart from our eyes. So the jinn don't actually have any, uh, any one shape. And this also explains culturally another phenomenon. What is that? Every single civilization and culture has a different perception of their demons and ghosts. Every single society and culture has a different shape of the evil things that haunt in the world beyond. Think about it, right? We have our shapes, the Eastern methodologies and religions have theirs. The ancient, no, again, I'm thinking of Scandinavia as well. If you go there, they have a totally different structure. The Japanese have their own. Every single civilization, which shows what? That there is no one unified structure that these beings appear on. However, one thing about them is all common. And that is that these entities in all cultures are terrifying to look at. Which means they purposely take on forms that terrify. Because they don't have original forms. They purposely take on forms that terrify. So, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Knowing that they don't have an original structure, and they're simply putting on this because in your cultural memory, this is what should terrify you. Honestly, this should give you power. And that's the whole point of today's lecture, by the way, inshallah, is to minimize this fear. The true mu'min is no more scared of the jinn than he's scared of a, a snake or a, a, a scorpion or something like this. And as your iman rises, then even that will become less, right? This is a fact, take this. Inshallah, by the end, we will work on this issue. But knowledge is power. Simply knowing, that's not how the jinn really looks. There is no real look of the jinn. Simply knowing that this structure that the jinn is looking at, he, or looking like, it's meant to terrify you based on your own cultural knowledge, right? It's not something that the jinn actually looks like. So in our Western culture, we have the two horns coming out or so dark red eyes or whatever. This is like this, right? Uh, in other cultures, you'll have a tail coming out. In other cultures, will be like a troll. In other cultures, so each one has its own. But the point is that the jinns, they're simply playing with you. They're simply wanting to terrify and... Imagine, you know, if you're uh, not as a child, as an adult, imagine if another adult is trying to terrify you, in front of you he puts on one mask and another, which one is going to make you scared? You would honestly think this guy is, you know, what do you think, I'm a kid or something? That's exactly how the mu'min feels when the jinn uh, tries to terrify. I hope that Allah Azza wa Jalla saves you from ever seeing one, right? But in, the re in reality, some people, the jinn does terrify, either in the dream, which is more common, Either in the dream, which is more common, or once in a while, very rarely, in real uh, life. Now, uh, jinns can... There's a difference of opinion who can see the jinn. One group of scholars says only prophets can see the jinn. That doesn't seem to be correct at all. For many reasons. Of them is the Quran and Sunnah. That clearly we see that the jinn can be shown to men. And of them is human experience. That every culture uh, sees the jinn. So the majority opinion that humans, all of them, can see the jinn if and when the jinn wants to reveal himself to the human. So the jinn has to desire to reveal himself. You cannot enter the world of the jinn, but the jinn can enter your world. You cannot just snap your fingers and be transported into the world of the jinn. And Allah explicitly says this in the Quran, Surah A'raf verse 27. Surah A'raf verse 27, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ He, Iblis, and his tribes can see you from a place that you cannot see them. He has access to your world. You don't have access to his. He can enter your lands or your, not lands, but dimension if you like, if you want to be philosophical or, or physics or whatever. He can enter your paradigm of living. You cannot go into theirs. So, 
any jinn, if he or she wants to, can appear in front of any human, and that is a power that they have that we do not have. And we'll talk about some of the differences between men and jinn, and the differences in power and in intellect. So, there is no original shape of the jinn, rather, and this goes back to another point, a lot of cultural legends are actually based upon the jinn. A lot of things that we hear about, stories and whatnot, they actually come from the jinn. So this notion of the young kids know what I'm talking about, shapeshifters. An entity that can go into any shape it wants. This is, it wants to. This is very common in many legends, in many civilizations. It's not just in Western culture. It's not just X-Men and that woman that can shapeshift or whatever, right? Not that you should watch that, but anyway. So uh, it's not just in this modern culture. Every civilization has this type of notion of a shapeshifter. Where does it come from? It is the jinn. The jinns are the real shapeshifters. The jinns can appear in any shape and fashion and form. They can also appear in the form of dead people. And we know this from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam when he said, if you see me in a dream, then know that you have really seen me because the shayateen cannot duplicate my form. What does that mean? They can duplicate anybody else's form. Anybody else's form, they can duplicate it. Right? So, this leads us to a very important point and that is that we, and youngsters especially, pay attention to this. We don't believe in ghosts. We believe in jinns. We don't believe in ghosts. A human ghost, we don't believe in that. They will come back and haunt people. No, that doesn't happen. The, the, the soul goes to the other world. The soul does not return to this world that we live in. The soul of the human goes to the barzakh. The soul of the human does not and cannot return to alam al dunya. It cannot come back to the world of the wakeful man. Maybe for the sleeping man. That's another question. We're not going to get into it now. But the wakeful state that we're in right now, the souls of the dead never ever come back to. So, how then do we explain people, you know, in, in seances and, 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 you know, they go to the, the magician or they go to the, uh, the people of the occult and all of a sudden the shape of the dead man comes up and talks. This is all the jinn. It's all the jinn. Never does an actual human soul come back to this world because it's gone now. Khalas, Allah says, Kullu One time you will taste it, that's it, you're going to move on. So therefore the jinns can come back and pretend to be human souls. Pretend to look in the shape of other people. We also learn from the seerah that the jinns can come and pretend to be human. They can intermingle with human and humans won't even know that they're jinns. We learn this from the seerah. So many incidents from the seerah. For example, of the incidents is the night of the assassination of the Prophet ﷺ. When the elite of the Quraysh gathered together and they decided finally once and for all we're going to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. What happens? There was a knock on the door and an old man from, you know, from the areas of Najd, from one of the chieftains, he looked like a, the chieftains of one of the upper tribes, northern tribes, right? And he gave the story that they believed him to be one of the elite. And it turns out that this was Iblis himself. And he was the one who told them the plot of why don't you send one man from every tribe to simultaneously attack so that it's complete chaos and no one person can be blamed. You know the story of the Hijrah, right? Where did it come from, Iblis? How did it get to their minds? He pretended to be an old man from that region, right? We also learn uh, in the Battle of Badr that Allah Azza wa Jal very explicitly says that Iblis came and pretended to basically uh, Iblis came in the form of somebody who was to become a Sahabi, Suraqa ibn Malik. So Suraqa, just because Iblis comes in your form doesn't mean you're a bad person. Suraqa became a Muslim. Suraqa became a Sahabi. At this point in time, now if you remember back in two years ago when we did this in the seerah, inshallah all of you fully remember, we have the note taker here as well, that why were they scared about Suraqa ibn Malik? Who can tell me? Asif, who can tell me? <laughs> who can tell us? Okay. Why were they worried about Suraqa ibn Malik and his tribe when they went to Badr? There was a feud between the people of Quraysh and the people of uh, uh, Al Jusham, Suraqa ibn Malik, right? And they were worried that if they attacked the Muslims, the tribe of Suraqa would come and attack Mecca. So what happened? Shaytan pretended to be Suraqa. 
It's very explicit in the Quran. It's very explicit in the Quran that shaitan came to them and said, Go forth and fight. You will be victorious. And I am a good friend to you. I'm not going to harm you guys. I'm going to be your protector. Don't worry. You, and of course, he's pretending to be from the other tribe. So Raqqa ibn Malik's tribe. So this gave them confidence and they left Mecca. What does this show? And then, فَلَمَّا تَرَأَتِ الْفِئَتَانِ When Suraqa, quote-unquote, Iblis now, when, quote-unquote, Suraqa saw the Fi'atan saw the other tribe and he saw the angel Jibreel come down and he saw the Mala'ika. He turned around and began to run away. And Abu Jahl stopped him and said, Suraqa, where are you going? You promised you're going to help. And he pushed him so hard that Abu Jahl basically flew in the air and he goes, Inni akhafullah rabbal alamin. You guys aren't going to win. I'm scared of Allah. And he fled. So Allah mentions this story in the Quran. The point or the shahid is what? That Iblis or a shaitan most likely it is the Iblis here. Uh, in fact, it, the hadith mentioned it is Iblis in, in this incident. Uh, whereas in uh, the, the incident of the assassination, it was one shaitan. Uh, but Iblis comes on the day of Badr and runs away. So he comes in the form of a man. Also, we have the famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim of Abu Huraira. That famous hadith of Abu Huraira that the Prophet appointed him to guard the uh, treasure uh, or the zakat that had come uh, uh, to, to the Prophet ﷺ, there was a large pile of money and so the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Huraira just guard this money for tonight make sure that nobody comes from outside the city or anything to take it away and lo and behold uh, Abu Huraira said I was almost about to go asleep when I heard somebody you know slinking around and, 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 and moving and I woke up and I saw uh, a poor beggar you know taking some money and going away I caught him and I said I'm going to take you to the Prophet ﷺ. how dare you steal sadaqa money how dare you have you no shame? So the man begged and pleaded and he said, I have a large family. And he continued to, to keep on speaking until Abu Huraira said, I felt so sorry for the guy that I let him go. Right? The next morning, the Prophet ﷺ asked him, how was your visitor last night? So Jibreel informed him, how was your visitor last night? So uh, Abu Huraira told him the story. So he said, he's going to come back again. Don't worry. So he's going to come again. So Abu Huraira said, Wallahi, this time, khalas, I'm going to for sure take him to the Prophet. The next night he didn't sleep at all. He was awake. Lo and behold, he comes, jumps on him, grabs him, and shaitan's sweet tongue works its way. On and on, begging and pleading throughout the night until Abu Huraira felt so sorry, he actually let him go again. Because he doesn't know who it is. He still thinks it's a human being. Once again, the Prophet says to him, and once again, he's going to come again. The third night, Abu Huraira makes a promise that I am for sure now not going to let him go. Well, he tries, he tries, he tries, and uh, Abu Huraira is adamant. I'm not gonna, this time, you're not going to convince me. Then he says, okay, what if I give you some advice? It will benefit you basically for as long as you live. It's going to be very beneficial advice for you. So he said, what is this? So he said, before you go to sleep, recite Ayatul Kursi. It will protect you from shaitan. So Abu Huraira took this advice and let the man go. Now this time he had to pay a ransom. This was the hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard the hadith, he said, Sadaqaka wa huwa kathub. Those who took the Asma Allah class, Fa'ul, kathub. What is Fa'ul? What does it mean? The one who's continuously doing the action. Sadaqaka wa huwa kathub. He has told you one truth, but he is a habitual, perpetual liar. Kathub, kathiba all the time. He knows nothing but kathib. And then he said, didn't you realize who was your guest last night? He called them the guest. Because who was it? Because that was shaitan. Now this shows us that, first they read Ayatul Kursi before going to sleep, because straight from the devil's mouth, as they say, <laughs> he himself has told us, and we don't care what he has said. More importantly, our Prophet ﷺ has said, he's spoken the truth. He's spoken the truth even though he is a habitual uh, liar. Uh, so, all of these hadith show us what? <coughs> that the shayateen can appear in front of the uh, jinn, uh, sorry, in front of the men. The jinns can appear in front of the men. And that it is also possible that they will take on the form of human beings. And Ibn Taymiyyah mentions that he knows for a fact uh, that so many... Uh, now this is especially true in the mystical groups that they think that their sheikh has holy powers, right? And Ibn Taymiyyah says, I can tell you so many stories of a group seeing their sheikh at the same time in multiple times. 
and he gives a very bizarre story that one day I visited a group of students in another city and they told me that they had called upon me, Ibn Taymiyyah, and I came to them to answer their needs and deeds. And I said, no, wallahi, I have never come to you. That was a shaitan pretending to be me in my image and form coming to you pretending to be me and of course he told them that you have to worship Allah alone you cannot call out others and whatnot so the point being this is even happening you know to Ibn Taymiyyah himself that an entity or a person that you believe is holy he's coming to you in your dreams he's coming to you uh, in your in your wakeful state and in reality this is nothing other than the uh, shayateen or the jinn himself so the point of all of this is what that the jinn can appear to the human when the human, sorry, when the jinn wants to appear in front of the human. And even our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned uh, this as well, that uh, once he was praying in Salah, and three times he said, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. A'udhu Billahi Minka, excuse me, A'udhu Billahi Minka, A'udhu Billahi Minka. And he took a step back. And then he took another step back. And then he took another step back. Saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan, or A'udhu Billahi Minka. And in one version, he's even pushing his hand. Then, he took a step forward. And he said, Bismillahi al-anuka bil-a'natillah. In the name of Allah, I curse you with the curse of Allah. And he took another step forward, he took another step forward. So now he went back to where he was, and they could see him with his hand out like this. Then obviously, when the salah is over, obviously, they say, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? So he said, one of the ifrit of the jinn, we'll talk about this in a while, one of the ifrit of the jinn came to me and attempted to, uh, you know, wave a, uh, one of the uh, branches of the fire in front of my face to distract me during the salah. And that's why I said, A'udhu Billahi Mink, A'udhu Billahi Mink, A'udhu Billahi Mink. Then I sought refuge in Allah and then I said, Bismillah, and I held on to him by the collar so much so that I could feel the coolness of his breath or his lu'ab or his, uh, you know, uh, saliva coming. I could feel basically, it's an expression in Arabic which means I could feel his body or I could feel how close I was uh, to him. And I thought, let me tie him up so that you can see him the next morning. Let me tie him up to one of the pillars. But then I remembered what my brother Sulaiman said to Allah. Give me a kingdom that nobody would ever have after me. And so I let the shaitan or the ifrit go. And we'll talk about this issue of Sulaiman uh, in a while, maybe even in the next uh, part two of this class. But Sulaiman, as you know, had control over the jinn. Allah gave him control over the jinn. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not want to compete with that. Because Sulaiman said, give me something nobody will ever have. So the Prophet ﷺ, thought to himself, if I tie the jinn up, then I would be infringing on the uniqueness of Sulaiman. And this is a very beautiful tangent or hadith here that uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not want to hurt or irritate or come across something that of his own brother amongst the Prophet Sulaiman. And so out of uh, camaraderie, Prophetic camaraderie, if you like, right? Out of uh, collegial respect, right? The, you know what I'm talking about here. You, out of respect to your colleagues. Like, okay, this is what he wanted for them. Even though he could have done it. But he didn't do it. Because Suleiman wanted something uh, unique. Uh, we also learn from one other uh, hadith that they, are, that they can come in other forms other than humans. We learn this from another hadith. And that is a famous hadith that all of you are familiar with, or some of you should be familiar with, uh, that once a man, uh, in, uh, uh, a, man uh, a young man of the Sahaba was newly married, and he was about to uh, go on an expedition, uh, and so he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, armed and ready to go, and he asks permission for one last visit to his beloved wife. You know, honeymoon phase, he wants to one time more be you know, intimate before going in battle. So the Prophet gives him that. Now the wife was not expecting him because uh, he's gone for the battle. And he comes back and he sees her in her house clothes out at the door. And of course this is very big immodesty. Like you're in your house clothes and you're not wearing the proper clothes and you're outside and he gets so enraged and incensed that he's almost about to strike her. Like how dare you? And she says, before you do anything, see what's happening inside. 
So he goes inside and there is a massive snake on their bed. There's a massive snake on their bed. And so he takes out his sword and the two of them begin to battle. And the narrator of the hadith says, we don't know who killed the other the first, but both of them died. We don't know who killed the other the first, but the both of them died. Then the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard the news, he said that uh, there are a group of jinn that have accepted Islam in Medina. So if one of you comes across a snake, then give him, in one version, three days, and another version, three warnings before you kill, So and then after that you may kill. Now, the point here is that the jinn appeared in the form of a snake. And the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. The jinn appeared in the form of a snake. Now this doesn't mean every snake is a jinn, obviously. What it does mean is that the jinn can appear in the form of certain animals. And when they choose animals for some reason that we do not know, uh, many times they appear in the form of, uh, of snakes. Now, by the way, the hadith of not killing snakes, it doesn't apply to Memphis, Tennessee, don't worry. Okay? If you see a snake in your house, <laughs> you may run outside and call somebody to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> the hadith of the jinns is specific to Medina because our Prophet said in Medina there is a group that has accepted Islam. Okay, And the point was that if you were in Medina at that time, you saw a snake that might be one of your brother Muslims of the jinn. So you tell the snake, either th one version says three days, another version says three times. You tell the snake, get out of here or else I will kill you. So. If it is a, a real snake, it won't know what you're saying, you will kill it. If it is a jinn, then you have, given, you have given the warning, and if it's a jinn, it will leave uh, before you kill it. The point being, all of these hadith show what? That the jinns can appear in front of the humans in forms that the humans can see whenever they want to do so, not when the human wants them to do so. Okay? Uh, of their characteristics as well, is that the jinns, they marry and they have children. They engage in intercourse outside and inside of marriage, and they have marriage, they do get married, and they have children. And this is proven in so many uh, evidences. Of them is the verse in the Quran, Will you take Iblis and his children, his progeny, as protectors instead of me? So Allah called, or Allah mentioned that Iblis has dhurriyah. And dhurriyah literally means his progeny after him. And also, of the evidences that the jinn uh, engage in intimacy is the famous ayah in Surah uh, Ar Rahman that all of you know. Lam insun qablahum wala jan. Neither men nor jinn have been intimate with these hur, which means that the jinn have the capacity to be intimate. The jinn have the capacity for this, but they, uh, these entities in Jannah or the Hurun Ain, uh, have not been touched either by the men or the jinn. They also eat and they drink. They also eat and they drink. And we learn this from so many ahadith as well. Of them is, well, you guys give me a hadith. How do we know the jinn eat and drink? Give me anything. There's so many evidences. Excellent. Excellent. What did the Prophet say? <laughs> what did he say? Very good. Don't eat with your left hand because shaitan eats with his left hand. Okay, it was in the test. Okay, alhamdulillah. Exactly. So the bone is going to be the food of your brother jinn. So they have food, they eat. With their left hand also, the famous hadith of Bukhari, that when you enter the house and you don't say, Bismillah, Assalamu Alaikum, the jinn says, Halumma, come here, there's free food to eat. Right? So, your meal becomes jinn meal. Your meal becomes jinn drive through They come through and they take your food. <laughs> if you don't say, Bismillah. So, all of this clearly demonstrates that the jinns need to eat. They need sustenance, just like we need sustenance. And in fact, we can also say that Every created being in this manner needs some type of sustenance. Only Allah is Al-Ghani. Only Allah is Al-Ghani. Every other created object needs something. What that is will be related to what it is. So the jinn needs something of their entities or whatever. We need something coming from the earth, so on and so forth. Also of the characteristics of the jinn is that we learn, uh, and this is a, a very 
simple story of Suleiman, and yet it is so profound that the story of Suleiman, when <clears throat> he wanted to bring the throne from the Queen of Sheba, and we know that Suleiman was given power over the jinn. Uh, when he wanted to uh, be given the throne from the Queen of Sheba, what did he say? That who will bring me her throne before she manages to come to me? Now Suleiman is in his temple, his masjid of Jerusalem, which was considered to be the most magnificent structure ever built by men up until that point in time. But it wasn't built by men, it was built by jinn. But it was considered to be a magnificent structure, tall, towering walls. What we would call minarets as well, massive slabs that humanly were not possible to do. This was a structure that was simply dazzling beyond recognition. And the Queen of Sheba had a throne that she was proud of. And perhaps it was a magnificent throne, but it didn't compete with the Suleiman Temple. Perhaps it was a magnificent throne. That walaha arshun azim. Now the fact that the Hudhud or the Hupi, who has seen the palace of Suleiman still considers her throne to be magnificent, clearly shows it was a magnificent throne. Clear? Right? So the Hudhud has already seen the palace of Suleiman. You guys understand the story? Am I? Yes? The Hudhud says, the Hupi says, after coming back late, that I came across a group that was worshipping the sun. They have a, a, a malika or a, or a queen. And walaha arshun azim. She has a magnificent throne. The fact that this bird, who is well aware of Suleiman's magnificence, can still describe her throne as being magnificent, demonstrates that truly her throne was an amazing, stupendous throne. So, Suleiman wants to show who has Allah Azza wa protecting him and who has no one. So, he says to his entire army, of birds and jinn and men and animals and uh, tigers and lions, all of the animals are there, right? Imagine, Allah, this is literally out of yani, what we would call a movie, but because that's because movies are based on this, right? That he's surveying his entire armies, tens of thousands of men, the jinn are over there, the animals and the birds and everything is there. And he says, who will bring me her throne? So. The first entity to stand up was Qala Ifritum min al Jinn. An Ifrit of the Jinn. And we'll talk about Ifrit in a while, but basically one type of Jinn. Now pause here before we go on. The fact that this story is being mentioned in the Quran and that it's taking place in the time of Sulaiman when all of the jinn are under his control. And that this jinn boasts of this feat indicates that this is the world record that is jinnly possible. You following me? Yes? The world jinn record goes to this Ifrit. That this is the pinnacle of what is jinnly possible. You cannot go beyond this. Because the fact that he's boasting, and it's only one, and it is at a time when all of the jinn are subservient to Sulaiman. This is not your average standard jinn. This is like the... Shahin Shah? <laughs> Bahadur Shah? <laughs> this is the, super, the, the gold weight champion, right? The super jinn. Okay, and again, all of this to demonstrate, look, the fact that Allah mentions it as well in the Quran, it clearly demonstrates this is not your average run-of-the-mill jinn. This is something that is above and beyond, and he's boasting. Now, a number of things to derive from this, and this story, really, it summarizes pretty much most of the characteristics of the jinn. The story, it summarizes most of the characteristics of the jinn. So, the jinn is asking Sulaiman for permission to be released from servitude to him because Allah had placed the jinn's servitude to him. So the jinn is saying, let me out of your service. Set me free. Now pause here. The whole uh, mythology of throwing a genie, the English word genie is from jinn, right? You know this, you should know this. The English word genie is from the Arabic word jinn. The whole notion of throwing a genie in the bottle and locking the genie up, the whole notion of flying carpet, all of this originates from Sulaiman and the times of Sulaiman. 
that the evil jinn were basically chained up or thrown in to something. Like that's something that originates from this time frame. Suleiman would sit on a carpet and the carpet would fly or Allah Azawajal would cause the wind to pick it up and go one month's journey back and forth. All of this originates from that. So the jinn is saying, release me from servitude, from bondage, set me free. And let me go and bring the throne. وَإِنِّي عَلَيْهِ لَقَوِيٌّ أَمِينٌ I promise you, I'm strong and trustworthy. So he wants freedom and he's promising to come back. Because once he's le left that, then it's like releasing a wild dog. How, how do you know he's going to come back? So he's promising him. I promise you I'll be trustworthy. You see the point here? right? Another thing we learn is that the speed of travel. Suleiman is in Jerusalem. The Queen of Sheba is in Yemen. The city is what? Saba. The city is Saba. To this day it is a famous city. right? And the distance between them is the entire Arabian Peninsula. By plane in our times, it will take around two to two and a half hours. By plane. Even in a jet, it will take you around 45 minutes to, se to, se to 70 minutes. Even in a, the fastest jet that we know. What is the jinn saying? Before you can stand up, before you can stand up, I will have the, the chair in front of you. I'll have the throne in front of you. Which means what? He will traverse the entire peninsula and bring the chair back in milliseconds. Milliseconds. Now, that is exactly how fast energy and light would travel. Speed of light, exactly. It's the speed of light. That's exactly what it is. He'll be able to come and back. Also, so we learn from this the speed of the jinn. We also learn from this the physical strength of the jinn. On average, jinns are stronger than humans. The average jinn is stronger than the average human. And this hadith kind of sets the max limit. One can imagine or visualize that this throne, again we don't know, but we can assume how large is a throne going to be? As large as this room maybe, right? As large or massive as, as going up as high as this room. And it will be a massive structure. Perhaps it would take 40, 50, 60 men to pick it up. Maybe even more. And the jinn is basically saying, I will bring it back single-handedly. What does that show? The average jinn is stronger than the average man. That doesn't mean every jinn is stronger than every man. Like we say, the average man is stronger than the average woman. There are some women, mashallah, tabarakallah, what can we say? Right? And may Allah Azza wa protect all of you from being married to them. But there are some women, they are stronger than men. In every sense of the term, okay? But the average rule is what? That the average man is stronger than the average woman, okay? Similarly, the average jinn is physically stronger. Is he all-powerful? No, only Allah is all-powerful. Can the jinn lift every... No. The fact that this is being given and this throne is a humanly conceivable weight. Perhaps 50 men, 70 men. It's not like... The world, it's not like heaven and hell. This is a created object, which is, realistically speaking, large, but large to us humans. It's not massively large. So one jinn is saying, I can pick it up. Another thing that we see from this story is that the jinn has the speed to travel, has the strength to lift it up, and this is to me the most interesting and bizarre and Einsteinian, and that is, the jinn has the capacity or the power to transform matter into energy. E equals mc squared comes into play here. To has the power to transform matter into energy and take that energy at the speed of light and then rebring it back to the way that it was. This is like Star Trek, right? Transformer, beam me up, Scotty. This is, this is what that is, right? Because obviously, the jinn is going to bring this throne, not in a physical manner, pick it up and bombard out of the palaces of the Queen of Sheba, and you will see a big throne flying in the air all the way to Jerusalem, and people are wondering, no, it will disappear there and appear over there. Which is from our world what? 
Teleporting. teleporting, exactly, yes. The seven-year-old knows. It's teleporting, exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. From our perspective, it's teleporting. That one thing basically transforms and then disappears. But obviously, and it is really amazing that we are living at a time when we understand how that is possible, even though it's not humanly possible. You understand this point, right? 50 years ago, 100 years ago, this would have been bizarre. Like, how? What? Now, thanks to Mr. Einstein, it's actually very understandable that it is conceivable, that energy is transferred to matter, matter is transferred. We don't have the power to do that at will. But clearly, some of the jinn do. Maybe not all of them, but some of the jinn do. That they can take something, and this also explains another phenomenon that we observe culturally, and that is that the jinn are able to bring physical things into your house or take it out of your house without you actually seeing something moving in your house, right? Something might just appear out of nowhere. You find the, we'll talk about this when we talk, do, the, do the sihr class, you might find sihr in your house and you're like, how did that get there? Nobody came to this room, right? And it's clearly locked or doors are here and yet all of a sudden it's under your bed. There's a sihr chart laid out there. Or it's, you know, in the depths of your closet. And you know nobody has been there other than you and your family. And obviously they're not going to put it there for themselves. So how did it get there? Clearly the jinn have the capacity to transform something that's physical into something that's immaterial energy and then re-transform it back. And that is something that is very uh, bizarre for us. But for the jinn it is human characteristics. Now uh, one final thing that we learned from this story before we move on to the other topics. And that is that the jinn... <coughs> We learned this also from the story of, of Iblis as well. These are some physical characteristics of the jinn. As for intellectual characteristics, as for intellectual or emotional characteristics, clearly the jinn are very different than us. And Allah has blessed us with more wisdom and intelligence and aql than the jinn. So the jinn have more physical capabilities than us. They're faster, they're stronger, they're invisible to us, and they can transform energy and matter back and forth. All of this is great and fine and dandy, but we have more wisdom than them. And wisdom trumps physical power. Wisdom trumps physical power. And that is why the manual labor amongst us gets paid eight, nine dollars an hour. Whereas the guy in the Wall Street office gets paid his entire year's wage in a day. Or the CEO's in a second, as you know I'm talking about here, right? Brains over bronze. This is the reality of human, and we know this. And it's how Allah created us. And that is why, even though Iblis was created from Nar, and Adam was created from Turab, Allah Azza wa Jal blessed Adam over Iblis. Intellectually, we are at the top. And so we win. Doesn't matter how fast they can go, doesn't matter how quick they can dance, we have the brains over them. And so Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala told Iblis to prostrate to Adam, not the other way around. And this also shows us another point, and that is that from the very beginning, Iblis was jealous of us. Iblis was jealous of us because he knew that Adam had been blessed over him and his jealousy caused him to become blind with rage and anger and this led him to always want to... Now what happens when you're jealous of somebody? And may Allah protect many of you from jealousy. It's one of the most petty and one of the most ridiculous emotions to have for the intelligent person. Ya khi, Allah knows what to give you and what to give somebody else. Thank Allah, you have what you have and Allah has given other people what He has given them. But Iblis got jealous. What happens when you get jealous? You want to show that you're better. So if somebody has a lot of money or whatnot, when he's in your presence and your heart is burning with jealousy, you act so petty and childish and you mention, oh yes, I bought this brand new car the other day. And casually mention, oh, I invested $50,000. What are you trying to do? Show off. Pretend you're better. Why? Because you have an inferiority complex. So Iblis and his progeny have an inferiority complex to us. To be psychological about it. Iblis and his progeny, they always feel they need to prove themselves. And in this 
proving themselves, in this wanting to be better than the other, this is where they take advantage of some amongst us, and some amongst us take advantage of them, and that is the intersection of magic, which we talk about later on. That is the intersection of magic, that is going to be part two of, uh, of this class. Now, uh, getting back to the list of their characteristics, so they marry, they eat, they drink, they have speed, they, uh, they, they, have str they can uh, lift heavy things, they can transfer matter into energy, they also eavesdrop on the angels. The evidences for this are, again, well known to all of you. The Quran is very explicit. In Surah Al-Jinn, Allah says, وَإِنَّا كُنَّا نَقْعُدُ مِنْهَا مَقَاعِدَ لِلسَّمْعِ We would sit up there in stations of sitting in order to listen. And in Surah Tabarak and in so many other surahs, at least six ayat in the Quran are about eavesdropping of the, uh, uh, of, the mala, of the jinn. And this also shows us that the world of the jinn and the world of the angels is a similar world. It's a different parallel universe to ours, if you like. That it is the world of energy. It's a different world. The jinn and the malaika are inhabiting that type of world. So they can sense one another and they can hide themselves one, from one another like we hide ourselves from one another with the physical barrier. They can hide themselves from one another with their own barriers. So that's what the jinn are doing. They're hiding in a way we will never understand. Behind something, like I would hide behind you in this wall. Behind this table, if I was scared, I'd hide over here. Physical barrier. So the jinn have their barriers. And they would hide behind those barriers, so the angels could not see them. Which means, the angels as well are not infinitely knowledge. The angels have their own sense perceptions. And the jinn are able to utilize that and listen. Then what happened, Allah says in the Quran, with the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, that was closed. With the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, the sama dunya was locked up. With the coming of the Prophet uh, the jinn only could go with great difficulty. Before the coming of the Prophet no restrictions. Because what does Allah say in Surah Al-Jinn? That we used to sit there all the time, right? And then, فَمَنْ يَسْتَمِعِ الْآنَ Whoever tries to do it now, يَجِدَّهُ شِهَابَ الرَّسَدَ He's going to find a fiery ball basically sent against him. Okay, so the jinn also eavesdrop upon the angels and the jinn uh, will die and be resurrected and face reward or punishment. So the jinn are mukallaf. The jinn have to worship Allah. The jinn are obliged to be righteous. And those who are righteous will be rewarded. Those who are not will be punished. So the jinn and us share this reality. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ insa إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have only created jinn and men in order to worship me. So jinn will also get Jannah if they're righteous. And jinn will be punished in Jahannam if they are not righteous. And uh, there are many evidences for this and I don't need to go into all of the evidences. We need to move on, mashallah. The time has really gone very quickly uh, and I still have... Literally more, I haven't even finished half of the material, so much to do, but very quickly inshallah then we'll consider this also in a part two. Uh, the jinn of the characteristics of the jinn is that the evil jinn love to inhabit evil places. The filthy jinn love to inhabit filthy places. And we learn this from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that the Prophet sallallahu said that inna hadhihi hushush mustahdara that these bathrooms uh, are, I could uh, mistranslate, these bathrooms are occupied. Because that's one translation of the hadith, right? But that's not what is intended because when we say the bathroom was occupied, these bathrooms are inhabited. These bathrooms are, there are things in those bathrooms. So when you enter the bathroom, make sure that you seek refuge in Allah from Al-Khubuthi wal khabaith When you enter in the bathroom, then seek refuge in Allah from Al-Khubuthi wal khabaith So these are some of the characteristics in the Quran and Sunnah of the jinn. Of the characteristics that is not in the Quran and Sunnah, but we learn from folklore, from legends, from conversing with the jinn. And we cannot be 100% certain, so I always make this distinction. Of the characteristics we learn from them is that the jinns have much, much, much longer lives than us. Maybe even hundreds of years. Because for them, time is not the way it is in our time. And of the things we learn from them, so it's not Quran and Sunnah, that quantity-wise, they are much more than us. Quantity-wise, they are much more than us because they don't occupy physical space. So, a jinn can have thousands of children. And 
the quantity of jinn far surpasses the quantity of men. And there is an evidence in the Quran that some have used, even though this is not explicit in this regard. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ma'ashir al jinni qad istakthartum min al insi. And one of the ways to translate this verse, which is not the most apparent way, it is not the most obvious way of translation. One of the tafsirs of the verse is, O groups of jinn, you have far exceeded groups of men. Ya ma'ashir al jinni qad istakthartum min al insi. And this is something that um, we learn from folklore as well and from you know interacting with uh, these entities. All of the cultures, they have these things that these beings live for much longer than that of men. Tayyib, moving on now. These are all characteristics of the jinn. Moving on. What types of jinns do we have? How many qual quantities or, or, or character or uh, um, uh, the, the types is the best word really, the species or the types. And the fact of the matter is this is much of what has been written here is pure folklore. So I will minimize this very much because honestly we really don't know. The hadith tell us one thing, the Quran tells us another thing. And put together, we just get some very basic categories. Of the simplest categories is, of the simplest categories is that there are Muslim jinn and non-Muslim jinn. This is very clear. And in fact, there's a very clear verse in the Quran in Surah Al Jinn. Allah says in the Quran, the jinn are speaking, wa inna minna al-Muslimuna wa minna al-Qasitun. There are some who are Muslims, and there are some who fall short and are evil. And Allah says also in Surah Al-Jinn, وَإِنَّ مِنَّ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنَّ دُونَ ذَلِكَ Some of us are good and some of us are lower than good. We are salih and we are not salih. So uh, clearly there are some Muslim jinns and there are non-Muslim jinn. And this is also proven in Surah Al-Ahqaf, the last page of Surah Al-Ahqaf, where Allah mentions in the Quran, uh, and this occurred, if you remember, uh, when the Prophet returned from Ta'if, and the night before he entered Mecca, bleeding and bloodied and bruised, he stood up in tahajjud. And Allah Azza wa Jal blessed him with a miracle that the people of the world might have rejected you, but even the other world will accept you. And Allah mentions in the Quran that, uh, what's the beginning? Is that it? Wa id arsalna, wa id. Sarafna exactly Arsana. And when we caused a group of jinn, what Sarafna ilayka nafaram min al jinn. When we caused a group of jinn to be diverted to go through you or to you. And Yastamiun al Quran, they heard you recite the Quran. Falamma samiruhu qalu ansitu. When they heard it, they told her, everybody be quiet, let's listen to this. And when they listened to you finish, they turned away having accepted Islam. And they went back to their people. And they said to their people, Ya qawmana, inna sami'na kitaban unzili min ba'di Musa. We have heard of a book that has come after Musa, affirming what Musa said, and O oh my people, accept this new messenger that has come. So clearly we find Muslim jinns converting and preaching to their fellow Jewish jinns. Notice, inna sami'na kitaban unzili min ba'di Musa. Right? So this also shows us another point we learn from folklore. We learn from legend, and the Quran gently hints at this. The religions of the jinns are the religions of men. You have Christian jinns, Buddhist jinns, Hindu jinns, and Muslim jinns. The religions of men are adopted by the jinn. And it's not the other way around. We don't adopt their religions. They adopt ours. What does that show, by the way? intellectually right we don't adopt their religions they adopt ours by the way we can also say we don't learn their languages they learn ours to communicate with us we do not learn they have their languages we don't learn them they learn our languages to communicate with us and you will have jinns that speak in human languages and this is well documented without getting all freaky on you and all that but well documented that you know the famous case of should I or should I not? The one that was made a movie out of, right? Um, no, not the, the Exorcist wasn't a different language. Um, Emily Rose, the movie that was made of Emily Rose, it is based on an actual story that from which we have tape recordings to this day, because this is back in the 60s and 70s, where a village girl, illiterate and uneducated, is speaking fluent Latin. Speaking fluent Latin. 
And this is a phenomenon that psychiatrists actually know about, where a person just learns a language out of nowhere and begins speaking it fluently. Right? Now, psychiatrists have their own weird and bizarre ways of explaining it. We don't need that weird and bizarre. It's very clear how a seven-year-old girl or 11-year-old girl can speak fluent Latin. Right? And you come across jinns that uh, will be speaking in languages that the person that is speaking has never been exposed to. But these are human languages. Human languages. And therefore, uh, this shows us as well, intellectually, the jinn are not as high as us. Because they have to learn our languages. We don't learn their languages. They have their language. We don't. So, we said, number one, there are Muslim and non-Muslim jinn. Number two, they are different ethnicities and tribes. Like we are. So there might be Desi jinn and Arab jinn. I don't know, man. <laughs> I hope they have one masjid, inshallah, from the unmosque. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, but uh, they, w they, they have different ethnicities and tribes. How do we know this? Again, very roughly hinted at, or very vaguely hinted at, in Surah Al-Ahqaf, that Allah says, the jinn say, قَالُوا يَا قَوْمَنَا They said, oh, our qawm, our people. So they have a qawm that is separate from the other jinns. So clearly they have different uh, ethnicities and different ways of dividing themselves. How they are, what those things are, we have absolutely no idea. That is something that uh, is beyond, it is ilm al-ghayb and we will never uh, know. Also, there are certain types of jinns that the Quran and Sunnah mention. And I will only mention the two that the Quran and Sunnah mentions. Otherwise, folklore mentions 1015. And I'll leave all of that. The Quran only mentions one special type of jinn, and that is Ifrit. We already mentioned him. Qala Ifritum min al jinn. And the Sunnah also mentions Ifrit, by the way, that the Prophet said uh, in the hadith of walking three steps back, three steps forward. In one version, it says, An Ifrit of the jinn came to me. And what is an Ifrit of the jinn? So, what we can gather from the Quran and Sunnah, the Ifrit is an especially evil an especially strong jinn. It's a type of jinn that has strength above and beyond what the other types of jinns have. And it has an evil nature that is above and beyond the evil of the average shaitan, which is pretty low bar anyway, and it's going to go lower than that. Okay? We know this because the ifrit challenged the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine how evil you must be to take on the Prophet ﷺ. And the Ifrit is the one that is saying to Sulaiman, I can bring the, 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 the throne. So, perhaps some have said that an Ifrit is like what the Westerners would call like a demon type of spirit. And the other jinns are the regular evil spirits. So, in, in many cultures you have this distinction of an especially evil entity and then you're regularly evil entities so we learn this from the quran and sunnah that there's an especially malevolent especially vile especially despicable breed of jinn and they are the ifrit of the uh, jinn uh, and they seem to be rare not that common uh, and they're not as common as the other jinn now there's a hadith in muslim imam ahmad that scholars have different about its authenticity but it basically mentions uh, in arabic is ghul and from this we get the English ghoul. The English ghoul. In Arabic is ghoul. And so there is a type of jinn that is a ghoul or a, a ghoul. Uh, and that is uh, just a jinn that is irritating and, and, and causing you uh, hardships and whatnot. These are the only two types that are actually explicitly mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. Now, folklore and legend, if you go to any book written about jinns by anybody, you will have, and is this type, and is this type, and this type. And the fact of the matter is that we don't know. This is simply ilm al ghayb But there is one hadith that is very fascinating, but we cannot explain it because it is ilm al ghayb How can you explain what you don't know? Hadith is very fascinating, and it is an authentic hadith. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, al jinnu thalatha. Jinns are of three types. Jinns are of three types. Number one, he said, some are snakes and dogs. Number two, some are yatiruna fil hawa, flying around in the air. And number three, some are yuhillun, they camp or they live and then they go away. Now, so he categorized jinn into three categories. Scholars have attempted to extrapolate and whatnot, and the fact of the matter is, these are cryptic. But what can we generically say? There's a category of jinn 
that typically appears in the form of animals. This is the first category. And two animals in particular the jinns love to appear in. But sometimes there are other animals. And the two main animals that the jinns love to appear in are snakes and dogs. The two most common animals that the jinns love to appear in are snakes and dogs. But this does not mean that they never appear in another form. They could have other forms as well. But the two most common, and that's why the Prophet said the first category are Hayat and Kilab, snakes and dogs. The second category is some are Yatiruna fil Hawa. They are flying around in the skies. And perhaps those types of jinns have almost nothing to do with us. Perhaps. Perhaps there are many quantities of jinns that are completely separate and cut off from us, have nothing to do with us. They are yatiruna fil hawa. And uh, again, this is ilm al-ghayb, we will never know. But maybe those are the majority of the jinn. The majority of the jinn have nothing to do with our world. They're living their lives and they're going by. And then the third, the third type of jinn is they come and they go. This is the one that seems to want to irritate us want to frighten us, want to come into our lives. This third category. So the majority of the jinns have nothing to do with us. They're living their lives, and the reason they become animals is to get access to our food. To be able to get to that food which is a physical food. So they take on the form of a, a, a snake or a dog, and then they can eat the food of the snakes and dogs. And then that will replenish their jinn. And then they'll become the jinn again. Now, other than this, frankly, I didn't want to get into all of the, uh, um, the, the, the folklore of the types of jinns. I want to stick with the Quran and Sunnah in this regard. The final thing that we'll say, inshallah ta'ala, uh, and, and that is, uh, well, very briefly, uh, are the jinns also, uh, do they have their prophets or not? Or oh, you want to make a comment right now? If it's Mustafa, you can make a comment. Go, Bismillah. So, uh, marada could be an adjective and not a noun of the jinn. I.e., especially... <laughs> I don't want to say... The obstinate. Right? And Ibn Taymiyyah comments on this hadith. Uh, and that's, inshallah, maybe in part two we'll get to this. Ibn Taymiyyah comments on this hadith and he said, Many people mistakenly think that all of the shayateen are ta chained up in Ramadan. This is not true. Only the marada of the shayateen. And the marada of the shayateen are the obstinate or the, 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 the ones that are especially going to harm you. Are they a separate category like the ifrit? Or are they simply the shayateen that are more harmful than other shayateen? Allah knows best. Because the ifrit seems to be like a, a different species of the jinn. Or a different clan of the jinn. And Allah knows best. So it could be that um, the marada of the jinn is like the ifrit. Or it could be that the marada of the jinn is simply one of their types of jinns that is especially evil. And Allah knows best. So these are all, of, and the problem comes again, all of this is ilm al ghayb. Uh, one final point before we conclude, and that is, uh, are jinns, are there any prophets of the jinns? Are there any prophets that have been sent as the jinn? And there's a lot of ikhtilaf on this issue. The majority of scholars of our tradition have said that there are no jinn prophets and messengers. Prophets and messengers are only human. Ibn Abbas held the position that prophets and messengers are human, but the jinns have another entity that we don't have, and that is nudur, nadir. So there's something called the nudur for the jinn. And this is based on Surah Ahqaf. That Allah says, فَوَلَّوْا إِلَى قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ They went back to their people as munzir, as warners. And the third opinion, which is Ibn Hazm, he said, no, there are prophets and angels, sorry, prophets and uh, messengers even amongst the jinn. So Ibn Hazm said, we have prophets and the jinn have prophets. And we have messengers and the jinn have messengers, but he was resoundly refuted. And the fact of the matter is that 
all evidences that are explicit point to the first opinion. As for the second opinion, it doesn't contradict the first opinion. You can say that there are nudur, that's fine, as long as there's no prophets and messengers. All prophets and messengers are men. And this also demonstrates the superiority of men over jinn. No prophet and messenger has ever gone to the jinn. And what is the evidence for this? Many evidences, but time is limited. We'll just mention one or two. Surah Yusuf verse 109. Surah Yusuf verse 109. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَىٰ We have only sent before you رِجَال Men, رِجَال, like human men that we have inspired them. And the entire Qur'an is full of stories of the previous prophets, all of whom were men. Not a single whiff of a jinn prophet. And also, our Prophet ﷺ clearly is saying, I have been sent to ins and jinn. Clearly he's saying, and that's why we say, al-mab'uthi thaqalain He's sent to both thaqalain And culture tells us, the Qur'an tells us, there are Jewish jinns, Christian jinn. No, the Qur'an didn't tell us that. But we learn from folklore and culture. We learn from folklore and culture that the jinns have religions that are known to us and nothing beyond our religions. So the fact that all of their religions are our religions demonstrates what? That they're following our uh, prophets and therefore because of this we also conclude that the jinn are obliged to believe in the prophets and they have the same theology as us, they have the same arkan al-iman, but we also learn that their fiqh is different and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to them on the famous incident called Laylat al-Jinn. How many times did Laylat al-Jinn happen? Some say one time, others say two times, some scholars even say six times there was Laylat al-Jinn. So it's not necessarily a one-off incident. Majority of scholars say it happened only once, but there are evidence to, su to suggest it happened multiple times, once in Mecca, once in Medina. What is Laylat al-Jinn? It is a night that the Prophet ﷺ dedicated to the jinn. And Ibn Mas'ud narrates a number of hadith. And when you put all of the hadith together, they couldn't all have taken place on the same night. So that's why some scholars have said there are multiple times this happened. That the first time this happened was in the Meccan phase, when Ibn Mas'ud said that we searched for the Prophet ﷺ and we couldn't find him anywhere and we thought that he had been kidnapped or assassinated. We had the worst night of our lives. And then the next morning he walks into the town and we embraced him and said, Where had you been, Ya Rasulullah? So he said, Atani atim min al jinn. One of the jinn came and they told me, and he told me that uh, I have a group that wants to meet you. And so he took me to their camp and he took Ibn Mas'ud and a group of Sahaba to the camp of the jinn. And he showed them the remnants of their camp. Now pause here. This shows that the jinn have their own equivalents. They also have to light their fires. How that is, Allah knows. But He shows them the equivalent. They also have their animals, by the way. There are animals amongst the jinn. Baha'imul jinn. This is mentioned in the hadith as well. And this is totally interesting for us here that Allah didn't just create the jinn in that world. That world has its equivalents of our world. So there are jinnish animals, if that makes sense. Right? And of course, the animals of that world are like the animals of our world. They're not mukallaf, they're not going to have jannah and na. So the jinn have their own fiqh as well. I always like to joke that they don't have to do wudu to extinguish themselves before they pray. Okay? The jinn have their own fiqh as well. What is their fiqh? None of our business. The Prophet ﷺ went with them, and this shows us the superiority of our Prophet ﷺ that Allah told him what the jinns are supposed to do, even though he's a human. And so they have their own fiqh rulings. Because obviously they have different you know, rulings, now, maybe they have different things, but their aqidah is the same. The final point that we conclude with this, inshaAllah ta'ala, protection from the jinn. And we'll talk more about this in part two, but I cannot give you part one without this, right? Protection from the jinn. And realize the whole goal, we're winding up here, listen to this carefully, my dear brothers and sisters. The purpose of this lecture was knowledge is power. Knowing who the jinn are, knowing their characteristics, wallahi, the more you know, the less you fear. The jinn have no power over you, unless Allah has willed it. The jinn can only harm you in a manner that is physical, but it is beyond your physical understanding. The jinn are not super powerful.
The jinn have limited strength, limited knowledge. The only thing that really messes up the equation, you can't see them. If you could see the jinn, you would fear them like you fear a predator. That's all. They have similar physical powers, not infinite physical powers. They're faster than you, a little bit stronger than you, but you have the advantage of the brains. And you have the most important advantage, and that is Islam. So, how do you protect yourself from the jinn? Firstly, following the commandments of Islam to the max. Following the sunan of the Prophet ﷺ. Many examples, eating, you say Bismillah, jinn will not eat with you. Drinking, drink with your right hand. You know, um, making uh, du'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, extra isti'adha, a'udhu billah. Especially a'udhu billah is the most powerful way to protect yourself against the jinn. When we read the Quran, fasta'id billah min shaytan rajim when we enter the bathroom, a'udhu. Allah mani a'udhu bika min al-khubuthi wal khaba'ith. Male and female jinns. When we are angry, what did the Prophet say? Say a'udhu billah because the jinn is making you angry. Right? When we have a bad dream, what did the Prophet say? Turn around and say a'udhu billah. Ista'idh billah. Okay? So all of these are isti'adah, seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing to protect yourself against the jinn is extra dhikr. Lots of dhikr. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, bismillah. Our Prophet said at night when every person goes to sleep, shaitan ties three knots on him. And shaitan says, may you have a long sleep and don't wake up for fajr. Sleep until the sun comes up. Right? So, if the person, the Prophet said, wakes up and remembers Allah, dhakar Allah, one knot is broken. So as soon as you wake up, you're supposed to say, Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. And that's the dua of waking up. What is the dua of waking up? Alhamdulillah. Not at'amana wa saqana. Okay, I thought you said at'amana wa saqana. No, no. Not after, unless you have food right there and you... <laughs> okay. Alhamdulillah. So, the dua of waking up, you praise Allah, you say Bismillah. So, when you do dhikr Allah, what happens? One of the, one of the knots is broken up. Also, in a beautiful hadith, listen to this, that... Um, a lady was on a camel, or on a, a horse, or was it a man? I forgot, now the Sahabi, a Sahabi, I forgot. I think it was a lady, but I'm not sure. And the horse, or the camel, it reared upwards. And this lady, or man, I forgot, said, Ta'isa shaitan. Basically, may shaitan be cursed. Why is he irritating my animal? So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't say, Ta'isa shaitan. Don't say, may, 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 uh, uh, may this uh, entity be cursed. Rather say Bismillah. Because when you say Ta'isa Shaytan, you make Shaytan feel very important. And he becomes bigger than a house. He swells up in pride that you blame me. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And when you say Bismillah, you make him feel so insignificant, he becomes smaller than an ant. So, to say, oh, this shaitan did it. And this is especially Pakistani Indian people here. It's in our culture. Shaitan ne kiya Right? <laughs> we need to calm down. Because when we ascribe things to shaitan, what happens? Shaitan feels proud. Yeah, that was me. Good. Right? Now, by the way, this is in, in context here. I mean, obviously, if you do it, uh, I, I shouldn't have said that because now I have to give all of these caveats and whatnot. You're not supposed to ascribe some type of power to shaitan over you or your animal or your house or, what, or something like that. But you may ascribe a past sin or a past issue. Oh, shaitan made me do that. That's something in the past. Nothing right now that you're giving him power. But you may excuse yourself, you know, shaitan misguided me when I was younger. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided me. As long as that you get to stage number two and you try to excuse yourself, like the brothers of Yusuf said, the Yusuf and his brothers, what did he say? That, oh, that was shaitan. Not, that wasn't you guys. Like he's trying to ex excuse his brothers, right? So in some contexts, then it's useful. But never in the present for right here and now. That shaitan, you know, caused this. No. You say, like the hadith says, you say, Bismillah. And shaitan will feel so insignificant, he will become smaller than an ant. So, 
so we had number one, following the commandments. Number two, isti'adah. Number three, uh, dhikr. Number four, or you can say 3a, it depends, or four, especially one dhikr when you leave the house. That is especially important. That our Prophet ﷺ said, if somebody says when he leaves the house, Bismillah, he tawakkaltu ala Allah. You all know this? Wala hawla la qusala billah. What's after this? Allahumma ni'udhu bika na dhilla aw dhalla wa zilla aw zalla wa adhlima aw udhlama aw ajhala aw yujhan alayya. This is a long dua. If you don't know it, then look it up in any book of dua. So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says this dua when he leaves his house, one shaitan says to the other, how can you get at a man who has been guided and taken care of and protected? How can you get to this man? He's now basically been forced, forced shield around him. So, especially this dhikr. Another thing that protects against shaitan is the adhan. The adhan. So we should give adhan in our houses as much as possible. We should uh, love to hear the adhan because shaitan uh, is disrespectful to the adhan. Shaitan tries to be sacrilegious when the adhan is heard. Shaitan makes the most sacrilegious noise imaginable and he's trying to make fun of the adhan. And this shows us the evil nature of shaitan that he wants to drown the sound of the adhan out. So we love to give the adhan. And the final point that we'll mention is Quran, Quran, Quran. Nothing protects against the jinn like the Quran. Nothing protects against the jinn like the Quran. That uh, we learned this straight from the mouth of Iblis himself. He told Abu Hurairah, recite Ayatul Kursi. And our Prophet would recite Falaq and Nas. And uh, our Prophet said that Shaitan can never enter a house where Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. Surah Al-Baqarah is recited, right? So all of this shows us that the Quran is of the most important ways to protect ourselves from the jinn. And therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, the jinn is not something to be feared any more than you fear a physical harm. The jinn is not anything that you should be scared of supernaturally. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, the one that you are truly scared of. And the more scared you are of the jinn, the more power the jinn has over you. Listen to me carefully. The more terrified you are of the jinn, the more you are handing over your power to the jinn. And the more that you are brave against the jinn. Automatically you will make the jinn weaker. Automatically. You simply tell the jinn, if la qaddar Allah, you are sure that there's an... And by the way, I have to point out here, subhanAllah, 99% of the time, if you hear some scraping noise, or you see, uh, or you, you hear some whatnot, it's your fridge that needs to be fixed or something. <laughs> you know? Like 99% of the time. It's the wind blowing or something. And I speak from experience as somebody calls me up this and that. Look, the jinn have something better to do than scratch their nails on your walls. Okay? They have something better to do than steal your pencil. And like, where did my pencil go? The jinn must have taken it. No. Maybe it's your kid. Maybe you yourself forgot it. I'm telling you, wallahi, the majority of time, it's your imagination. It's something you have not. But... Once in a very blue moon, and may Allah protect me and you, something genuinely happens that you can sense or you can feel. And yes, there is a feeling that there is an entity that is evil here. That's very rare. Very, very rare. And many people live their lives and it never happens. And may Allah make you and me amongst them. But sometimes you feel that. Or, la qaddar Allah, you actually, and it is true. I mean, there are people that you see an entity wanting to terrify you. This is very, very, very rare. And in my many years of doing this, I don't think anybody has come to me with the story of a wakeful entity coming. In sleep, yes, that's much more common. In sleep, the jinn will terrify you. But a wakeful entity, like somebody, when you are awake, excuse me, and then some entity coming to terrify you, I have never met somebody uh, like that. I have heard from others and researched and whatnot. I have never met anybody that has told me that when I'm awake, this entity has come with goblin and this. That's, that's horror movies. That's so rare. It does happen one in a billion, but it's very rare. What is more common? Dreams. What is more common? Irritation and other methods, waswas, whisperings and whatnot. This is more common. We'll talk about that and then sihr, the issue of sihr. We'll talk about that in part two. But in part one, if you feel that there is some evil entity harming you and whatnot, what do you do? 
Bismillah, Ayatul Kursi, you control your fear and you tell, you say, for example, Bismillah, you know, you cannot harm me unless Allah has willed. I believe in Allah. I am Abdullah. So when the Prophet was, was performing exorcism, we'll talk about that in part two, um, that he actually said, Bismillahi ana Abdullah, ukhruj Allah. Everything is linked to Allah. Bismillah. Ana Abdullah. I am the slave of Allah. Get out of here, O enemy of Allah. So whatever you do, link it to Allah. Don't say yourself or don't say the jinn. Yourself and the jinn, nothing. Link it to Allah. Allah will protect me against you. Right? Get out of here in the name of Allah. For example, this is what you would say. If that were to ever happen. Otherwise, inshallah, inshallah, I can assure you, this is so rare that the vast majority of people live their lives and they never see anything like this. And that is because the jinns have better things to do than come and scare you like a goblin. They have their lives. Believe it or not, they have to earn a sustenance as well. They have to feed their families. Think about it, right? They have better things to do than go turn your light switch on and off, you know, in the middle of the night, you know? <laughs> Once in a while that might happen to somebody, but I mean, usually it's your kid coming in or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, alhamdulillah, learning the Quran and Sunnah will calm us down will empower us, will make us less and less scared, and the perfection is not to be scared of these entities at all. Because they cannot hear your thoughts, they cannot read your minds, they are physical creations of Allah that have certain different characteristics than you. That's all it is. They are physical creations. They are creations of Allah. They have certain things that you don't have because of this. They might have a, an advantage over you in some areas, but overall you have the advantage over them in brains and in iman. And if you have these two combined, uh, then inshallah ta'ala that can never harm you. Uh, we have some time for Q&A and inshallah we will have a part two sometime soon. Allah knows when. And that will be for adults only. And huh? At night time in the camp, we will light the fire, <laughs> right? Huh? <laughs> but that will be no kids allowed to that one. Yes, Dr. Bashar, go ahead. Just a couple of questions. One of them regarding the physicality of the jinn and how they're probably energy of Allah Adam, and how would the Prophet be able to tie somebody up and, uh, to the to the uh, to the pillar of the masjid or Abu Huraira wrestle with someone and catch him? They don't have a, I mean, they can turn themselves into energy and fly away. You can't really tie them up. The other thing is, you know, the, the encounter with the jinn, you said the, the casual and the rare encounter, but there's also the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ma ahadin illa bihi min jinn. Every one of you has a qareen. What is the qareen issue and how do you deal with it? Okay, so the issue of the physicality of the jinn. As for Abu Hurairah wrestling with the jinn, so when the jinn takes the form of a human, it has to downgrade its powers. And it is physical at that point in time. And there are a hadith, not a hadith, sorry, athar, of there is an athar that I did not quote today of a sahabi wrestling with a jinn and overpowering the jinn in a physical form when the jinn was a human. And the Sahabi didn't know it was a jinn, turns out it's a jinn. So he wrestles with him and then, and then beats him uh, in a physical form. When the jinn becomes a human, the limitations become human. And Allah knows best, maybe they can't just instantaneously become a jinn again. Maybe it takes some effort. We don't know. So that is why Abu Huraira could physically grapple with him. And if a jinn enters into a body, it's not easy for the jinn to leave that body. It's not that simple. And this is the issue of possession, which that's going to be the rated R stuff in the next lecture, right? Not for now. Uh, that if the jinn enters the body, it's not easy. It's actually very difficult to get the jinn out. So I'm talking about E equals MC squared. It's pretty clear it's not that easy. And the Ifrit was talking about the maximum. That's the first thing. The second thing about how the process was doing it, that's Ha'lim al Ghaib. That's Ilm al Ghaib. How could the process tie up a jinn? Obviously, not with something physical. He was th thinking about another method of maybe through the angels. We don't know and going to be beyond our scope. The uh, other question you asked was the Qareem. So when I talked about the interaction I meant with the eyes, I should have clarified. Jinns do not just appear in front of us at random 
day and night. And we all know this from our own experiences. Every culture knows this. No matter what the culture is in the world, seeing a demon or a something is the exception and not the rule. Correct? That's what I'm trying to say. We're not talking about the effects of the shayateen on us in waswas. That's a whole different topic which we might get into even in part 3 because part 2 is about sihr and, and, and ruqya, right? The, the issue, or actually I've given a khutbah two years ago, three years ago about seeking protection from, from shaitan here at MIC. So the issue of shaitan's waswas and qareen, I didn't talk about today. That is a whole different topic of what is the role of shaitan, why did Allah create shaitan, how do we protect ourselves against particularly shaitan. That is a subtopic of what I did today. I didn't shed too much light on that. Maybe we will in the future, inshallah. Sisters, any questions? Yes. This is what the brother Bashar is. A, is a, you have a qareen. This is, this is a shaitan. That when every one of us is born, a shaitan is assigned to misguide us. So that is the qareen. No, the Quran does not mention the throne of Iblis anywhere. It's mentioned in Hadith literature. That Iblis is so arrogant that he wanted to compete with Allah. So if Allah has a throne, Iblis made his own throne. This is a Hadith. It's in the water somewhere. That he has a, water, uh, he has a throne over some body of water. But we don't know where and obviously... It doesn't make any sense to try to narrow it down to the Bermuda Triangle or something like this. We, we let it go, inshallah. Yes, go ahead. Um, like animals, are they, um, like for example, during night, at night time, you know, uh, when a dog just starts barking and whatnot, are they able to, you know, sense the, the jinn and uh, if, you know, when a jinn enters, or, or you know, is, is in a dog, dog form, for example, or a snake form is there, a way to tell that that animal in fact is. So the second question first, is there a way to tell that a particular animal is a jinn or an animal at any given time? No, not immediately, no. Mm -hmm. That the jinn outwardly will look like that animal at the time and that is why our Prophet explicitly said, speak to that entity and tell it to get out of the house. So if it is a jinn, it will understand you. Because it's a jinn. Uh, and if it's not a jinn, it will understand you. So there's no easy way of telling. Uh, that is the case. However, I don't want to tell any weird stories or not, but if the animal starts acting more than just like an animal, <laughs> we just leave it like that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe, like, uh, kind of like that type of stuff, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so if the animal has certain powers that clearly animals are not typically having, then you can imagine it's not an animal, okay? And your other question was what to... Uh, if a dog, dog, for example, is a can the animals see the jinn? Yeah. It appears that certain animals can see the jinn better than we can. Yes, mm -hmm. it appears this way from folklore. It appears that certain animals, in particular dogs and cats, might be able to perceive the jinns in a manner that we are not able to perceive. Okay. Yes, brother. In the back. Well, Mustafa, and then you. Okay, Mustafa, because you, Mustafa had his hand first. Mustafa, and then you. Have you seen the sixth sense? <laughs> <clears throat> Where do they get these from? Think about it. Think about it. Uh, what did I tell you? I mean, if you understood the joke I'm saying, the hadith translates the shaitan does not open a closed door. That's the hadith. Shaitan does not open a closed door. And if you look at the folklore, the famous movie that came out, they had this, one of the rules was the demon is not going to open, the ghost is not going to open the closed door. Where do they get this from? These are things that as we, they, they simply, it's real and humanity kind of figures it out and our Quran and Sunnah proves it in different ways and so it merges together. So the meaning here is that quite literally, when you close the door and you mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shayateen will not be able to enter it. It will be a barrier against them, quite literally. 
Right? But the point is, and that is why even when you go to sleep at night, the Prophet said, cover up your food. There's a, the hadith, the hadith, like, don't just, same thing, don't just leave it like that. Cover up your food and say bismillah over it. So, if you have a cup of water at night, you shouldn't just leave it outside if you're going to drink in the next morning. You just put anything on top and just say bismillah, cover it up. Because their barriers are different than our barriers. And our Prophet has told us, once you close the door and you say bismillah, once you put something on the food, you say bismillah, in a manner we will never understand. It will never, they will never, and let me give you another of these myths. Um, in the Scandinavian countries, they believe in these uh, zombies and, and, and Draculas and whatnot. Again, one of the rules is what? You have to give permission for it to come into your house. If you don't give permission, it's not going to come into your house. And there are horror movies based upon this as well. Okay, that is trying to trick you to get into that. And again, this hadith that shaitan cannot open the door once it has been shut. Means once you have shut it off and you are, you are following the sunnah, then it will not be able to open, uh, open up. And therefore, you are supposed to close your doors at night. And you're supposed to say the name of Allah and over food as well. And shaitan will not have access to it. Kids are especially vulnerable at one particular time. Uh, that is Maghrib time. That around Maghrib time, for around 40-50 minutes, we should bring the kids in. Authentic hadith of the Prophet That that's when the shayateen are let go. And so they like to irritate and tease and, and whatnot. Uh, because they are shayateen. I mean, this is animalistic, isn't it? You want to tease a young kid. That's what they are. They are shayateen. So during this time, we bring them in and lock the, or shut the doors. Then, once the maghrib time has passed by 20-30 minutes, if they want to play outside or whatnot, uh, then they are allowed to do that. Yes, brother, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. You know, in this day and time, with information technology and YouTube and TV and Discovery Channel and all of this, I think all of us maybe have seen this and probably asked the question, and some have this uh, ancient aliens and ancient astronauts and you get into the stories of in the Bible and the Nephilim and all of this type of stuff and the videos and the evidences of craft and UFOs and ETs and we can laugh if we want but if we look into it there seems to be something there. We as Muslims, how are we to maybe view this? Is this a, possibly a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which we have no knowledge of? Do we associate this with the jinn? Is there anything that we can, can, can look at in the Quran and the Sunnah that maybe possibly will answer this phenomenon? So the brother asks a very good question, and that is, what is our position about alternative life forms, i.e. aliens? Do Muslims believe in aliens or not? And the fact of the matter is that this isn't a funny question, it's a very serious question. But we don't call them aliens. Has Allah created other beings? Or are we the only creation of Allah? That is the question. And the response is we will never know for sure in this world and most likely in the next we won't care. <laughs> but some scholars, including Ibn Taymiyyah, have opined that Allah Azza wa Jal has created other life forms. And that this goes back to the perfection of Allah being Al-Khalaq. Khalaq means the one who continues to create. So the notion that the only creation is us, and after we're gone there will be no other creation, it seems to suggest as if La hawla wa billah, that Allah is not really creating perpetually, continuously. And Ibn Taymiyyah felt that this diminishes the majesty of Allah. That he felt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been constantly creating and will constantly continue to create to no end. And that what we know is only our world. That in our world Allah began in this manner and there's going to be Yom Al-Qiyamah. This is our portion. There are others as well. Before us and after us. Are they simultaneous to us? Ibn Taymiyyah didn't talk about that. Ibn Taymiyyah is talking about the issue of Allah always creating. But there is no negation of the fact that other worlds could be simultaneous to us. Or other creations could be simultaneous to us. And there are many evidences that might possibly suggest this. So, 
please don't misquote me. Don't tweet Yasser Qadi saying there's aliens. Please, careful. <laughs> Keep my reputation and others. I'm saying there is some evidence to suggest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created other creations. Whether they are before us or after us or the same time as us, the Quran does not mention anything. But the Quran might possibly suggest, is that clear? That there are other creations. It might possibly not suggest that either. What are some of the evidences? Number one, وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ He has created things you will never know, you don't know about. So you will never know, which means this is not something you can see. وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ He has created things you don't know about. And we continue to discover new species every day. That's not what Allah is talking about. Something else. Number two, that Allah says in the Quran, that خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ الْأَرْضَ وَبَثَّ فِيهِمَا مِن دَابَّ Allah has created all of the heavens and the earth and He has scattered throughout all of them creatures. Not just on the earth. The samawat and the samawat as we talked about in Surah Yusuf and in the tafsir. Uh, the samawat is not just our heavens. It is beyond our heavens. And Allah says He has scattered creatures in all of them. And if He wants to, He can gather all of them up at once. Or He can gather the two of them together. Uh, now you can understand this verse to mean the day of judgment, which is the majority interpretation. Or you can understand it to mean Allah has created all different creatures and if He wanted to, He could cause them to meet. Both are linguistically possible. There are other evidences as well. I'll just jump straight to the one I think, Wallahu A'lam, is the strongest evidence to suggest that there might be other creations of Allah. And Allah knows best. Surah Isra, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا We have honored the children of Adam, and we have carried them in the land and in the seas, in our times we add in the airs, and we have given them many things, and we have preferred them, humans, over many other things that we have created. Which means we have preferred some over them as well. Do you understand? We occupy a high rank according to this verse. But not the highest. You could interpret this. Again, you could all of this is ihtimalat, right? Which means, now in the world that we inhabit, who is at the top of the pyramid? I mean, in the creation. It's us. Who bowed down to us? The angels. The jinn. So then we are at the top in this world of the creation, right? Yet Allah says in Surah Isra that we have honored the children of Adam over many other things we have created. Not all. So again, these, these are all gray areas. So to, to summarize, and with this we conclude, we went way over time. The Quran does not explicitly claim that there are other life forms or before or after us. But a number of famous theologians, Ibn Taymiyyah has an entire section dedicated to it. And one famous non-Muslim scholar by the name of John Hoover, J-O-N-H-O-O-V-E-R, has written an entire paper. If you have... I think it's even on PDF Google now, just Google it. It's called The Perpetuity of Creation in the Thought of Ibn Taymiyyah. It's in English, it's in fancy schmancy academic English, but it's in English. And you just Google it by John Hoover, The Perpetuity of Creation in the Thought of Ibn Taymiyyah. It's an entire paper where he com compiles what Ibn Taymiyyah said in his evidences in simple English, well, not simple English, but in English. And basically, this is the summary of it, that he says, it befits the majesty of Allah to have created and to continue to create and we are but one of Allah's infinite creations. Does that answer your question or confuse you even more? <laughs> confuse you even more. With that, inshallah, it is uh, Jazakumullah khair. We will figure out when to do part two, but that's going to be a little bit more advanced. I'm happy that you're here for part one.